everybody, welcome to this uh, research seminar. Um, we might just give people another minute to join us because I can see the uh, participant numbers are still um, ticking up um, here, which is fantastic. Really good, really strong turnout today. So we'll let that tick up for just a minute more before we um, before we get started. Still, still going. Brilliant, a fantastic turnout today. Welcome everybody to um, to our research seminar this afternoon. I think um, we probably will get started now. Um, so uh, I am um, Ellen Thomas. I'm the Interim Chief Medical Officer at Genomics England. You will have spotted by now that I am not Professor Matt Brown, who I think often sits in this chair. He is off um, sailing on the high seas. So um, I have the privilege of chairing this afternoon's uh, session. Um, so um, I, the first thing I want to do is just let you know that this seminar is being recorded and will be available afterwards on our YouTube channel. Um, so I hope everybody is, is happy with that, uh, that recording. The seminar format is that we are here for the next hour or so. We have um, two speakers today. Um, they are um, not two sets of speakers today. So they are internal Genomics England speakers because today our seminar is focused on um, two of our uh, big Genomics England um, initiatives. So um, the I will introduce the speakers um, in in a minute as we as we get to their um, to their to their each of their sessions. But we're rough roughly sharing the slot in halves between them, and we'll stop for Q and A in between the two uh, the two sessions. Um, on the, if we get to the next slide, thank you. So we do want to remind you that um, that the um, Genomics England Research Summit is coming up on Tuesday, the 9th of July. I do hope that many of you have already registered or already submitted um, abstracts to that. There are a few limited spaces left. So if you haven't registered, uh, please do. And uh, we look forward to seeing many of you um, at, that, uh, at that event. Um, on the next slide, uh, we would also like to remind you that we have another research seminar coming up at the end of May. Um, and uh, we have a fantastic presentation for the first half of that um, on um, really exciting um, new finding um, in the, uh, from a member of the research community. And um, we will confirm the second speaker nearer the time. So um, without further ado, I would like to um, introduce our first session, which is on our Cancer 2.0 and Long Read Sequencing Programme. So our speakers this, morning, this afternoon are Emma McCargo, who is the Programme Lead for Genomics England's Cancer 2.0 Programme, and Rowan Howell, who is a genomic data scientist focusing on cancer long reads. So thank you both very much for, um, for talking today. Could I ask that everybody, um, while we're just getting the slides up, please, if you would like to ask a question, please put that the, the, your question into the Q&A function. It's quite difficult to spot questions as they come in, um, if they come in by a different route. So please do put questions into the Q&A function at any time during the talk, and we will pick those up in Q&A at, uh, at the end of the talk. No hands during the talk, please, no hands raised during the talk, because we will let Emma and Rowan give their full presentation uninterrupted and take Q&A at the end. So over to you, thank you, Emma and Rowan. Thank you very much, Ellen. Thank you for the warm introduction. Um, so as Ellen said, I'm um, Emma McCargo, my role at Genomics England, I'm the programme lead for cancer and I'm responsible for uh, one of our strategic initiatives and that's the Cancer 2.0 programme. Um, it's one of three initiatives that we have as an, um, as an organisation. And um, I'm, I'm joined by my wonderful Colin Rowan, who's going to give you um, an update and some insights into some of the work that we've been doing in the programme. Um, but before I hand over to Rowan, um, I just wanted to, um, next slide Rowan, please, thank you. I guess I just wanted to kind of give you an outline of the programme itself. So this is a programme that we received, um, we were lucky to receive funding for a, a couple of years ago. We are now into our third year of, um, of funding um, for this programme, third year of the programme. And it's divvied up into two separate projects. So one is our long read sequencing uh, project, which um, Rowan's going to talk you through in a second. And then the second is our multimodal data um, program, which is really just helping us to, uh, we are working to bring in genomic, um, uh, marry, sorry, imaging data alongside with our existing genomic data set to see if we can enrich the um, data set and 
um, uh, explore and help uh, researchers with their learning machine learning algorithms to predict um, uh, to drive sort of novel uh, predictive models for uh, response to treatment and prognostic indicators. So those are uh, both uh, two programs are very actively working on at the moment in the organization. And in terms of the Long Reads program, we have um, essentially four, four objectives that we're kind of aiming for. Um, the first being is to see if the technology itself lends itself to be able to be distributed. So this is really quite radical from our existing operating model where it's very centralized. And so we're exploring with NHSE whether we can actually distribute that sequencing capability, um, but still have a centralized um, analysis um, platform. And second is really just around more um, the sort of, I guess, articulating the um, whole genome sequencing where you can have many tests in one. Um, so what we're looking to do is to sort of see if we can um, uh, concur and demonstrate concordance with standard of care, but also demonstrate that actually through this test, we'd be able to answer um, an array of clinical questions. And then the third and the fourth outcomes um, that we're hoping to achieve is really pointing towards um, fundamental tenets of the NHS. And the first being is to make sure that we are using the right technology for the, for the work itself. And that's to ensure that we actually have um, uh, you know, the, the, the appropriate capability and the right test in place for the NHS. And the second being pointing towards equitable access for um, patients within the, um, the testing pathway. So I'm gonna hand over to Rowan now. Rowan's going to kind of give an update on some of the activities that the team have been doing within the programme. So over to you, Rowan, thank you. All right, thank you, Emma. Okay, so um, I guess just to start with, I'll give a, a bit of a broad overview on where we are at with building a cancer analysis pipeline um, based on long read ONT sequencing. Um, so kind of not included on this plot is is there are some sort of earlier um, uh, bioinformatics stages around base calling, uh, which we've pretty much got uh, got sorted and our pipeline is already running uh, in an automated way, uh, performing base calling on our samples. But what we're really working on now is is identifying the right bioinformatics tools to do uh, identification of the variants that we're interested in within our ONT data. Uh, so the sort of the five types of um, tools we're looking for are tools to identify structural variants, small variants, and perform DNA methylation calling, which is going to be what I'm, I'm mostly talking about today. So I'll go into a bit more detail on what exactly what that entails in a second. Uh, but we also would like to be able to call copy number variants and perform brain tumor classification, which again is something we'll uh, I'll be digging into in some more detail. Um, and so kind of the state of where we're at at the moment is that we're quite confident, actually, that we have, have good tools for, for calling structural variants and small variants and identifying uh, methylated DNA bases. Um, we are still sort of in the process of finding the right copy number caller. Uh, that seems to be something that's a, a little bit more tricky um, to get the, the especially the somatic copy number calls in our in our cancer pipeline. And uh, as I'll explain in a bit more detail, we're kind of in the early stages of working out what we can do in the space of brain tumor classification as well with this data. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if anyone's working on these kinds of tools, do feel free to reach out. And we're always interested to hear about kind of more tools and, and get a, a sense for what's out there. So today I'm going to be talking mostly about um, this, this topic of brain tumor classification using DNA methylation data, which is something we get from our ONT data. Uh, so just to set the scene on this, um, I'll start off by talking a little bit about brain tumors in general. So brain tumors are really quite a diverse group of tumors. Um, they entail both primary tumors, which uh, originate in the brain, and also metastatic tumors that might arrive uh, in the brain from other parts of the body. But even those um, those tumors within the brain have, uh, for example, different cells of origin. And, and because of that, the, the prognosis and the treatment options available to patients can vary drastically depending on the type of tumor that that patient has. So a really important part of treating a patient with a brain tumor is working out exactly which type of tumor they have. And so the key tools that are used to do this diagnosis are, uh, well, primarily pathology slides. So these are 
uh, slides which um, have a smear of tumor cells on them. And the, the pathologist will use these uh, with a microscope to examine the morphology of the cells. And they may also do immunohistochemistry to look at expression of specific markers. And now there are also, you know, uh, genomic markers, for example, IDH1 mutations or specific copy number changes that can help to identify specific types of, of brain tumor. But a, a piece of information that is really um, grown to, to be incredibly important in this process recently is DNA methylation profiling. So when we talk about DNA methylation, what we're talking about is the addition of a methyl group. So this, this uh, carbon uh, group highlighted here onto the cytosine base uh, within what's called a CPG motif. So this is just a, a cytosine followed by a guanine in the, in the sequence of DNA. And so addition of this, this methyl group changes the, the sort of the chemical structure of the DNA and um, it, it is heritable. So when the, when the cell divides, the patterns of DNA methylation are passed on to the daughter cells. And so because of this, this is uh, DNA methylation is very representative of different cell types and is uh, because of this, it, it is very uh, representative of different tumor types as well. And so uh, in this plot here, what we can see is basically a, a T-SNE uh, sort of clustering plot here where uh, lots of different brain tumor types have been clustered purely just on their um on the state of the methylation status of different CPGs throughout the genome. So we can see that uh, these clusters resolve pretty, pretty well. And just, just on the basis of methylation data, we can identify lots of different uh, types of brain tumor. So uh, the tools based on these are becoming very, very important in, in uh, diagnosing brain tumors. And until now, the, the, the way this is done is using what's called the Heidelberg classifier. So this is a machine learning classifier that was trained using uh, Illumina methylation array data. So the Illumina 450K or uh, Epic arrays. And um, when this first came out, this was there was a lot of excitement about this because in general, this was performing at least as well as a human pathologist. And actually in the cases where the pathologist and the, and the classifier disagreed, uh, they went back and examined those samples in more detail. And in most cases, the computer was actually found to be correct rather than the pathologist. So this, this technique is really, really uh, accurate and can really um, help to streamline that process of, of diagnosis. Um, and so this has become a sort of gold standard in, in clinical practice. But this, uh, as I say, this classifier is built for Illumina methylation array data, which is different to the, uh, the methylation data we get from oxygen nanopore sequencing. So just to get an idea for what we really mean here when we're talking about arrays, ONT data. Um, so the array is, is a set of probes that bind to specific parts of the genome. And those probes will uh, will basically, different colored probes will, will bind depending on whether the, um, the CPG is methylated. So you get a sort of ratio of fluorescence coming out of your machine, which tells you about how, what proportion of the CPGs in that location were methylated. Um, so that's that's the kind of data you're getting out from your uh, methylation array data. But ONT, our data is totally different. So oxygen nanopore sequencing works by pulling a strand of DNA through a nanopore and measuring changes in the potential across the uh, the pore as that DNA goes through. And from that, you get this sort of trace, electrical trace, and sort of deconvolving that trace can be uh, means that we can work out the sequence of base pairs. And also uh, when uh, there's modifications to those base pairs, for example, DNA methylation, we can sort of infer that from that trace. So it's a totally different type of data and, and um, it means that we can't necessarily um, directly take our ONT data and, and feed it into that um, Heidelberg classifier. If anyone's interested in what ONT methylation data looks like, I'll show you just this sort of example here of uh, a plot that we've made using ONT data. So what we're looking at here is uh, along the sort of uh, x-axis here, we have um, individual reads of DNA across a, a region. Um, this is a, a promoter region we're, we're looking at here. And these blue dots are unmethylated CPGs and the red dots are methylated CPGs. And so we can see that we get sort of a two dimensional type of data here where we can see both how uh, individual CBGs are methylated 
uh, across different reads, but also along each read, how those patterns of, of methylation co-occur with each other. And so it's a very rich data set um, and a lot, a lot sort of a lot more detail than we get from the, uh, the arrays. So we've done some benchmarking, and uh, when we compare the uh, array data to our nanopore sequencing, um, there, there are some big differences, as I say, just in terms of the way this data comes out, uh, but also just in terms of the number of CPGs we can actually read. Uh, Illumina arrays uh, will assay between sort of 450,000 to a million CPGs. CPGs, but with our ONT data, we're getting up to sort of 30 million CPGs, theoretically all the CPGs in the human genome. Um, as we mentioned, though, the sort of the, the output we get is slightly different. We can only really talk about sort of fractions of fluorescence as the output for a, a given CPG with the Illumina array. With our ONT, we can look at both those fractions and a sort of longitudinal analysis. Uh, and the, these plots just sort of highlight what I was saying about how we can't necessarily substitute values one for one. If we look at the distribution of the sort of fractions uh, with the Illumina array or the ONT data, we do see that we do get these sort of peaks of methylated and unmethylated CPGs, uh, but the position they're in is slightly different. Um, so we 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 have a good a, a sort of degree of concordance between the two technologies, but on a sort of individual value level, we can't necessarily substitute one for one. I think we're slightly um, running out of time here, so I'm going to I'm going to skip through some of the details here because I want to get to um, the discussion of the classifiers we've tested out. Um, but so in in our analysis, we've been tiring out a, a set of different brain tumor classifiers that are designed to work with um, ONT data. We're benchmarking them against the the Heidelberg classifier, uh, which is the tool we I discussed at the beginning, uh, which is designed for the um, Illumina arrays. So the three tools I'm going to present today are NanoDX, Sturgeon, and CrossNN. Um, sort of from a machine learning perspective, each of these has chosen a different machine learning uh, framework to use. Um, and so uh, there's some slight differences there, uh, but they are all built off the same data set, uh, which was the original data set that the, uh, the Heidelberg classifier was trained on. So um, we have 14 samples here, which uh, we have uh, both our ONT sequencing and Illumina arrays for. And so we basically just compared the outcome of these classifiers against um, the Heidelberg classification. There's a slight uh, complexity here, which is that the classifiers can both be uh, correct or incorrect in terms of their classification. But they also give a, a confidence score on how good they think their classification was. And so not only can they be correct or incorrect, they can also be confident and unconfident. And obviously, we kind of would prefer everything was confident and correct. But if that's not the case, then we'd at least rather that the uh, the classifier knew when it's wrong. And so it is important that we can separate out those cases where they are um, confident and incorrect from those ones where they're unconfident and incorrect. So... But just looking at the sort of overall numbers, we can see that NanoDX performed the best. Uh, it does seem to outperform the Heidelberg classifier on this data set. It got one more confident classification. The other two do perform pretty comparably to the Heidelberg classifier. They did have a couple of uh, false positives, though. So uh, these are cases where they got the wrong answer, but they were confident in their classification. Um, and when we look at sort of uh, this by the, the samples and we compare the status of each of these classifiers uh, across each sample, we can see that they're really a lot of the issues that we're having here come from specific samples, which are presumably just quite hard to classify. And this is experience that um, we've seen before um, from the Heidelberg classifier on, on epic arrays as well. So there are just some samples which aren't necessarily easy to, to fit into those, um, those classes that were in the original data set. Um, looking at some specific errors, uh, is quite interesting to see sort of why this this classifier sometimes goes wrong. Um, so, for example, in this case, all of the classifiers got this classification wrong, but two of them actually decided that this was control tissue. Um, so this is a, a sort of a, a class a class that was included of just healthy control brain tissue. And in fact, we we know from the short read sequencing we've done that this is actually quite a low tumor purity sample. So in fact, these may almost be correct. They're just responding to sort of the majority of tissue that's in that sample as opposed to the um, the, the tumor uh, tissue in there. So um, that's a level of complexity we need to sort of be able to take into account there. Similarly, um, 
when, when we do these comparisons, there's lots of different classes. Some of them are more different than others, though. For example, the glioblastomas are split up into subtypes, which aren't necessarily very uh, informative from the perspective of uh, treatment of a uh, sort of management of the patient. And so, for example, in this case, uh, this was a slight subtype error uh, from one of these. Um, but actually, you know, uh, that is still probably correct in the sense that it still managed to work out. It's, it's a glioblastoma. So just to, just to give you a, an idea of the complexities around benchmarking these things, we have to be able to take into account um, some slightly uh, tricky um, comparisons here. Okay, so I think we are slightly out of time. So I'm going to just, uh, just skip forward to the end here. Um, but I just wanted to say sort of the conclusion here is that based on what we've seen, uh, we do have this this classifier Nano DX, which seems to be performing very well. Uh, and and um, it seems to be performing at least as well as the Heidelberg classifier. There are some complexities here about how we report these results, especially when we're talking about things like low impurity samples. Um, but Long term, we'd like to expand this to a, to a much larger cohort. There are sort of 80 or so tumor classes within this uh, classification scheme. We'd like to be able to represent all of these within our analysis to make sure that there aren't sort of biases uh, towards um, individual tumor types here. So this is still sort of a work in progress. There are still other tools kind of coming out as we speak. So we'll continue updating this analysis as we get new samples in. Uh, but we're, we're quite confident that um, this is something that we should be able to implement um, with our ONT sequencing, which is very exciting. I'm just going to finish off by just saying that um, if anyone is interested in working with the long read uh, sequencing that we've been generating, some of it is now available in the research environment. Uh, so this there, there's a number of samples spread across different sort of indications. We've got some uh, triple negative breast cancers, uh, some childhood brain tumors and endocrine tumors and uh, liquid tumors as well. And for a subset of these, we do have methylation data available. So if anyone is interested, uh, I recommend to go and check that out. Okay, so uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Rowan. That was um, absolutely fascinating um, uh, and speedy um, whiz through some really fascinating work that you've been been doing there um, in, in this really clinically complex um, area where there's, you know, there's so much clinical unmet need in this area. It's, it's and there's lots of um, applause coming in virtually from everybody. So um, thank you. Thank you for, um, for, for that. So we do have some questions starting to come through. Everybody, please do use the Q&A function to, um, uh, to uh, ask questions. Um, so Rowan, um, first question that's come through is uh, what programming languages were used to um, to utilize the ONT classifiers? Um, so these classifiers are mostly standalone tools. Um, so Nano DX is uh, implemented in Python. Um, Sturgeon, as I say, is a standalone tool that you just run through um, the shell, um, cross NN, I can't remember off the top of my head. It'll be either uh, in Python or R. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. And, um, and the second part to that question was, are the ONT classifiers open source? Yes. Um, well, are they? That's a good question, actually. I'm just thinking that one through. Um, so definitely nano DXs. Sturgeon, I'm not so sure, uh, or at least, I mean, with, with these machine learning tools, it may be open source in the sense that the implementation is, but I'm not sure whether the weights of the model are open mm. source. Mm. Uh, so the yeah. tool is available, but maybe not the underlying code. Yeah, available. but what is interesting about this is that actually the original uh, classifier, the Heidelberg classifier, that is not open source. And that is one of the sort of the, the advantages almost of ONT uh, implementations of this is that um before with the uh the array based classifier everyone was having to upload their data to the internet on uh, to get these classifications which wasn't ideal um so we can kind of get around that that issue um with these implementations which is a, a bonus yeah that's that's great really helpful excellent um several more questions in for you Rowan they um they're staying along these these excellent technical lines so um Next question is, how does Nano DX perform on low tumor purity samples compared with the other classifiers? 
Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we don't really have enough samples to say for sure. I mean, I can definitely say that, you know, in that example we showed with the low purity uh, sample, Nano DX did manage to get that right, um, whereas the other ones didn't. Um, wait, no, no, Nano DX didn't get it right on that one. But um, over, the, over the entire list of samples, Nano DX did perform better. Uh, but as I said, we don't really have enough samples. We're only working with 14 at the moment. So it's hard to generalize those to, to more samples, unfortunately. But yeah, it's yeah. something we'll be keeping a close eye on because we, we can see that that is a potential drawback mm -hmm. to the methods. Yeah. Yeah. So just to follow up on that one, I guess, do you potentially see that there might be some, you know, when this tool come, comes towards these, these new tools come towards clinical practice, there might be a role for kind of, you know, tomb of purity thresholds, as it were, for when the, when the tools yield meaningful results? Or do you think that with a few more samples, you might be able to sort of dig in a bit more in the low, low purity samples? Yeah. I mean, it's a really interesting question. And I think especially because ONT data, we have this long range, um, you know, we do have these long reads where we can see the how, how uh, methylation occurs sort mm -hmm. of laterally as well as just yeah. vertically. We do have a, a potential to sort of do some um, bioinformatic analysis where we sort of enrich for the tumor reads before we do the mm -hmm. classification. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's one way we could go to try and sort of improve the performance on the um, the low purity samples. In the meantime, though, I think, yeah, it probably will be a case of probably setting some some thresholds on where we believe um, the results to be trustworthy. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. I think we've got another couple of minutes for questions. If you're if you're right for us to fire a few more at you. Yeah, Rowan. yeah absolutely. Um, yeah. Could you tell us a bit more about what data was used to train the three ONT classifiers? Yeah, so all of this data. Um, Data is the same data source, which is from the original 2018 paper, which introduced the Heidelberg classifier. So this is a set of, um, uh, so it's it's all based on the 450K Illumina arrays. And uh, there's, so there's 90 different classes represented. I think around 80 of those are tumor classes and uh, roughly 10 are uh, control classes. And, um, it, it's it's a, a very interesting data set because some of these entities are very, very rare. And so you may only see a handful of those across, you know, the entire country um, in a given year. So uh, it was actually just accumulating enough samples of all of these particularly rare types was, was pretty difficult. And so that's kind of why that's, that data set is still being used is that um, it's kind of impossible to replace some of those samples very easily. Um, so yeah, in the short term, everyone's still using that original data set. Excellent, uh, thank you. Um, the next question is, um, given that the sample size is currently so small, would it be more mm. appropriate to use Bayesian classification over frequentist? Well, um... that may be one that's a bit, that's a bit deep to go into, um, to go into in, the sort of minute and a half we've got left but i don't know if you have any yeah. preliminary thoughts on it i guess um the so the original training data set is very large much larger than the 14 samples we have so i yeah, yeah i I'm, i don't think that's the case yeah <laughs> you, think, you think we're okay right yeah. lovely um i think i've got time probably just to squeeze one more in um how many samples are planned to be sequenced with long reads and have methylation data i don't know whether that's your a question for you or whether that's an emma question well, I can quickly say that from it's kind of historical reasons that we do have BAM files without um, uh, methylation data available in the research environment. Sort of moving forward, typically we will be generating methylation data for everything, um, but it's sort of a, an ongoing uh, project. And I, I don't know if Emma, you have a number in mind, but I, I don't think there is a specific number on how many samples we're likely to have. No, we don't have a specific number in, um, but certainly we are working with multiple sites now, and we've also um collaborated with a number of researchers so we expect this number to increase exponentially um yeah. for sure and we can certainly come back to this forum in the future and update um everybody in the audience on on the outcomes that we've got be happy to do that that sounds great thank you Emma. so there was yeah. one more question in um in the q and a um which is which relates to techniques for somatic copy number calling i wonder whether rowan you might be so kind as to just 
um, put a little written answer in that as we're now out of time. Um, and sure. perhaps also to follow up on what Emma just said, we could suggest uh, that you come back and tell us more about some of the other tools and techniques that you've used um, in the in the long read work at a future at a future seminar. Um, but in the meantime, just wanted to say a very big thank you to Rowan and to Emma for that um, excellent first half of this afternoon's um, seminar. Thank you. And we're going to move on to the uh, second half of um, our seminar uh, now, and we're moving on to another of our um, key um, programmes that we are um, engaged in at the moment. And I'm delighted to introduce for this Amanda Pacchini, who is the Clinical Director at Genomics England, who has been very involved in the generation study from, um, from early on. Amanda is a genetic counsellor uh, by background and has been um, with us at, at Genomics England for about three years, working primarily on this study um, alongside a, a broader remit. In, um, in terms of clinical leadership in the organisation. So, um, Amanda, thank you very much for telling us about the Generation Study. Thank you, Ellen. Thanks for the kind introduction and for um, inviting me to share with you all about where the Generation Study is at at the minute. Um, so over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to take you through an overview of what the Generation Study is and the position we're currently in in terms of recruitment and where we hope um, research from this study will help us to get to. Um, so before I get into more about what this study is about, I wanted to start with the why. Um, so to give you a couple of examples of stories, both of which have been in kind of mainstream media with the BBC stories linked there. Um, Owen, for example, he's um, a, a young child who was actually a participant in the 100,000 Genomes Project. Um, and he was struggling with his growth and development. And through the 100,000 Genomes Project, he did actually manage to find a diagnosis of a um, rare variant in a gene, uh, which meant that he had a, a, a form of kind of hypothyroidism, but interestingly, wasn't a type that would have been detected um, on the blood spot test, which does look for congenital hypothyroidism. And so for Owen being able to have um, thyroid hormone supplement that was hugely helpful to him and his parents do comment in that story about what additional help they may have been able to have had Owen been diagnosed even earlier than he was. Um, as another example, um, a story about Libmeldi, a very expensive gene therapy drug for metachromatic leukodystrophy, where as a, as a story that we might often see, certainly as a genetic counselor meeting families with genetic conditions, by the time they have diagnosed a child with one condition, the younger child may have already been born, and in this case, both had that condition. So the time at which that drug was made available meant it was helpful to treat the younger sibling, um, but for the elder sibling, her disease had already progressed, and so the two um, siblings were going down very different paths, but could see the huge benefits that could be provided to the one being able to receive that treatment. So that's really the kind of impetus for us wanting to proceed with the generation study to be able to explore what the utility and feasibility might be to use genome sequencing in the newborn period to identify a wider range of rare conditions and to enable wider research into diagnoses and treatments of rare conditions. So our study, kind of funded through the Department of Health, um, is for up to around 100,000 newborn babies um, with three general um, overarching aims. The first of which is to um, look, uh, evaluate the, the utility and feasibility to look for a larger number of childhood onset rare conditions using genome sequencing as a technology. Um, and as parents will be consenting for their baby's DNA, not just to be analyzed, but also stored in a de-identified way in our National Genomic Research Library, we hope that we can also understand not just how well that study worked in the short and long term, what the outcomes were for babies and families, but also for that wider discovery research that might enable us to um, understand other gene disease associations, develop new treatments and diagnostics for NHS patients. And the third aim, which is a more exploratory aim, is helping us to think about the potential risks, benefits, and implications of having that genome over a lifetime, that long-term storage that we would have that genome on file, uh, where we might be able to ask different questions of that genome at a future point in those participants' lives. Um, whilst we haven't committed to doing any future analysis at the moment for participants, we know that that ability to, to recontact and ask for that is there and want to be able to explore different participant and societal views around that question.
Um, as a research study, um, our research aims and protocol and materials have all had to be REC approved, or approved by the Health Research Authority. And as I'll get to in a moment, um, we'll be returning results back to the NHS and therefore we are very much running this study in partnership with the NHS, as well as with um, the NHS Blood Spot Program and National Screening Committee, who um, are keeping very close eyes on what we're doing in terms of the evidence that we can provide to inform potential screening approaches in the future. Um, our approach to developing this study has really been driven by um, co-design ethics and engagement from the beginning. So we started in 2021 with a national public dialogue that asked the question whether we should even be thinking about a, a research question to look at genome sequencing in the newborn period. And there was broad support for that, but with a number of suggestions and caveats and considerations that we should make sure we really think through before delivering a research study like this. So I'm one of a, a large kind of core in-house team that's focusing on the generation study, but I mentioned we also work very closely with the NHS, including two key governance groups, a strategic implementation group and a clinical assurance group that's particularly focusing on the conditions and treatment pathways that link to the NHS for those that we'd be looking for. We've also over the last couple of years brought together a number of expert working groups that have focused on different elements of the study to help us to design it from the um, process of recruitment in the antenatal period through to deliberating on some of the broader ethical issues that might be raised by the study um, and thinking about our approach to interpretation and reporting and um, guiding what our pipeline and reporting process should look like. So where are we now? We've spent the last sort of two to three years or so in these first three stages um, from coming up with a vision and focus on what the study will look like, those three aims, to um, a large element of that co-design and feasibility with our working groups and with a range of user research to help test and iterate how the study processes and materials would look like. We've gone through our research ethics committee review and are just at the point now where um, the initial trusts are uh, just starting to invite parents and collect those initial samples to participate in the study. So we're right at the cusp of actually starting to see what this study might look like in practice. Um, but steps four, five, and six um, are um, just as important as the first three in setting up. We actually need to now run the study, be able to monitor the study as we scale, be able to evaluate it as it, go along, as it goes along. And hopefully that's where a lot of our learnings will come from to think about that potential of step six if the evidence review supports it and think about what implementation into routine NHS care might look like in the future. In terms of where our study is happening, it'll be through a range of sites throughout England, and we've taken a careful approach to thinking about which sites would run the study along a number of different factors. We want to make sure that this isn't just something that could potentially work in a large research active urban hospital. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were looking at a range of sites with um, differences in terms of birth volume, uh, maternity and research department performance, geography across England, the diversity of those communities who use those hospitals um, so that we can really understand some of the implementation factors um, that uh, could impact this process more broadly. Um, sites will be opening kind of progressively over the coming months. Um, those that are highlighted in pink are ones that we've had furthest discussions with are, and are in those early stages of either starting or just about to start recruiting participants. And the others are uh, ones where we are have started and are continuing conversations about them onboarding in the coming months as well. This is a very busy slide, not really to read in depth, but just to really show you the sheer um, amount of user research and co-design that has gone into the development of the study. So right from sort of August 2021 through to um, uh, earlier this year and ongoing, we've had a team of design researchers working on the study, which have worked with a number of parents, both those that have had experience of a rare condition and crucially those who haven't because those parents making uh, decisions to join the generation study won't have um, a necessarily have a history of a rare condition in their family as we're taking that broader screening approach. So um, interviews with, with parents, as well as with midwives and healthcare professionals to be able to test some of the concepts around the study, the understandability of them, the content of them, um, how parents might make decisions about the study throughout their pregnancy journey um, to really help us make sure that the materials that we've developed and the service design, the process that a, a journey a participant will take is something that's considered a lot of the factors that might already exist in terms of best practice in the NHS or that we can try and do our best to make sure that there is as equitable access as possible to taking part in the study.
So this slide just really gives an overview to what a participant's experience will be like, and I'll dig into a few of these areas in the subsequent slides. But in general, um, and as a culmination of that engagement and co-design that we've done, um, parents will be hearing about the study around midway through pregnancy. They might hear about that earlier. There is flexibility amongst sites, but around midway through pregnancy, parents may hear about the study or be directly approached by a member of the um, funded study team in their hospital site and be invited to take part. And at this point, we have a range of materials, um, including a kind of patient information sheet, but also information on a website, videos, decision scenarios um, that parents can interact with um, and with members in their support system to make an informed decision about whether they'd like to take part. They would be making their consent decision ultimately um, shortly before birth because samples would be taken very shortly after birth. And an earlier sample feasibility study we ran um, helped us to um, look at the DNA quality and operational aspects of what samples would be um, ideal to take for this study. Um, so the primary sample will be a cord blood sample, um, but with the backup potential for taking an additional heel prick uh, blood sample. And throughout this process, we've worked uh, really closely uh, especially with the National Screening Committee and the Blood Spot Program, because we want to make sure that our materials and our processes, both for parents and the healthcare professionals involved, really distinguish the difference from us as a research study to the standard of care blood spot test that happens, uh, that's offered to every baby at the moment, uh, and is an important public health program. So we're really keen to make sure that we are not disrupting that. Um, all of them of the baby's uh, genomes um, after they're born and samples taken will be analyzed and we'll return a result for each participant. I'll go through in a bit about what those potential results could be. And um, beyond that result period, as I mentioned, um, then that data, um, their genomic and uh, longitudinal health data, like other um, research in, uh, library participants, um, forms part of the uh, National Genomic Research Library or NGRL and can be made accessible to approved researchers to answer wider research questions and with the potential, um, like other NGRL participants, um, for withdrawal from research um, at any time. Uh, obviously, this is a newborn participant group with parents making decisions on their behalf. So we're also mindful that uh, in the coming years, we will be thinking about um, how as children gain more of their own autonomy, they would also be partners in making those decisions and eventually be making that decision themselves as to whether their data would remain in the research library and as part of the study. This is just a snapshot of some of the materials that we have developed. Um, if you go to generationstudy.co.uk, you can access a wider range of these and see the content that we've developed on there, um, including kind of cohesive branding and really using content design to try and make this accessible at a reading level while still capturing a lot of the complexity and nuance that goes behind the study and the expectations that we want to make sure are really clear um, for parents. We expect this to be a largely digitally savvy population um, as, as parents at this stage. So a lot of our information has been made available online. And we've also um, worked to get uh, many of these materials translated into commonly spoken uh, non-English languages that match to the sites that we'll be running the study in. One of the key questions we often get asked is, um, which conditions are we going to look for? In theory, we could look for hundreds of conditions off of a genome sequence, but there are many ethical and operational um, reasons why it may not be appropriate to look for um, some as opposed to others. So we took a multi-step approach to coming up with this conditions list, which again, on our website, you can read more about the steps that we took as well as see the current list of conditions that we would be testing for in the study. Um, in brief, we um, started with a consensus working group to help to find some principles that would dictate um, which conditions we would look for. And these largely reflect um, making sure that these are conditions where there's a strong gene disease association, that we can look for the disease causing variants and actually find them on genome sequencing, that these are conditions where to the best of our knowledge, there is high penetrance and that there is an early or pre-symptomatic intervention that can help manage the symptoms of that condition. That doesn't mean it has to be a full-on cure, doesn't mean it has to be a gene therapy. Um, there are other conditions, for example, where early awareness and avoidance of sun exposure can be really helpful to reduce the high risk of skin cancers for children with xeroderma pigmentosum um, or for a number of metabolic conditions where dietary changes um, can be really important. 
Um, but it did require us to put some guardrails in place to not look for, for example, adult onset conditions or for a wide range of neurodevelopmental conditions, perhaps where there isn't necessarily a pre-symptomatic intervention that can help ameliorate the effects of, of those conditions. And we know that this is something that we'll have to keep reviewing on an ongoing basis. We then worked closely with NHS specialists, um, a lot of geneticists and pediatricians with expertise in managing those conditions to help make sure that we were um, really capturing the known uh, known information about those conditions, making sure that we were involving commissioning as well, so that when we say that there is an intervention that can be done, is that actually available um, in the NHS, so that we're not giving families a result that then leave them floundering as to what could happen next. So really wanting to make sure that there are clear mapped pathways in place for any of those conditions that we identify. Um, really high level on our variant prioritization strategy. Um, unlike the genomic medicine service or the 100,000 genomes project, where we took a very different approach to how we analyze variants, because we have a phenotype in front of us that will help us interpret those variants. Um, using a screening approach and with newborns who will largely be asymptomatic and we're not then collecting that phenotype information up front, we had to take a much more conservative approach to how we would um, prioritize and report variants. And that means we would only be reporting variants that are at least likely pathogenic or pathogenic. Um, and, and our pipeline will help us to do that. There are also some genes where we have a more defined variant inclusion or exclusion list based on known published information or information from experts. And then crucially, we have a manual review step. So once those variants are prioritized, we have a small number of seconded clinical genomic scientists um, helping to review those prioritized variants. They can make sure that those variants in combination with each other um, have the evidence um, underneath them to um, warrant reporting to the NHS as a suspected condition result. And we think that's really helpful to make sure that we're minimizing um, the reporting of false positives as much as possible. By taking a more conservative approach, we know that we are also then likely to miss cases. We're not going to capture every case of every condition we're looking for. So it's also really important that we've made that really clear within our materials and training for healthcare professionals. So in terms of results, the vast majority of participants will um, not have any of the conditions we suspect. They won't have any of the variants in those conditions that we're looking for. We expect that around 99% of participants will have that result. And so one of the um, uh, materials we've co-designed is this letter um, that will be issued centrally from Genomics England. It really tries to make it clear that this does not mean a clean bill of health for the baby, that any other family history or medical concerns should continue to be pursued as normal, um, and also give some information about what it means to continue to be a participant of the generation study beyond receiving this initial result. And a version of this letter will also be sent to the participant's GP. Um, a small proportion of participants will um, also, um, we won't be able to get a result for, we may, it may be that a sample couldn't be taken, or DNA quality fails um, for one reason or another. We think that will be a very small proportion, but we will be informing participants when that happens as well. Um, but although rarer, a lot of, proportionally more effort has definitely gone into how we can define the processes for those 1% of babies that do have a condition suspected result. And one of our working groups focused particularly on this. Um, our um, uh, information from parents and healthcare professionals and the um, screening program um, has suggested that best practice would be that um, the for parents should first hear about a result of a suspected condition from an NHS specialist who has expertise in managing that condition. So that's been a lot of work we've been doing to map the different conditions on our list to the relevant pediatric and genetic specialties involved, making sure that we're clear on who would be the right pediatric um, specialist that would be making that initial call to the families, and then making sure that they can be linked into that wider multidisciplinary team um, for onward testing and support. Within Genomics England, we have a central case manager that will help pull together a referral pack. Um, I'll go through a couple of those things in the referral pack that we've developed to help make that process as smooth and as consistent as possible. And then we're working with the Genomic Medicine Service Alliances, as they are regional structures within the NHS, to have a result coordinator sat in each one that will help provide a link between us centrally at Genomics England and the relevant NHS specialist team that may be within that region that would be contacted when a result comes through.
Uh, it's important to note that because we're expecting a thousand results across the country, across the duration of the project, for any one individual specialist team, we'd expect the volume of cases coming to them to be really quite low. Um, but we want to make sure that for each of those cases, we have the support in place to manage that really carefully. So also through the GMS alliances, we've provided initial study funding for um, genetic counseling support and have been working closely with Genetic Alliance UK um, to make sure that we're linking with patient organizations that map to the conditions that we're testing for so that those participants have the right access to support and those patient organizations have some information about the study to expect those queries coming to them. I want to make sure I have time for questions at the end. So I just wanted to go through a couple of the key elements of the results referral pack that a specialist um, team would be receiving. The first is a confirmatory test pathway. So for the conditions that we are looking for, for the vast majority of them, there is a non-genomic confirmatory test that would be available to help give parents that clarity about whether or not that condition is present. Um, there would also be a need to do um, confirmatory genomic testing of the variants that we found, although typically that we think that could be done on a non-urgent basis in parallel. Um, but for each of these conditions, we've pulled together a high-level pathway or guideline um, that maps out what those expected confirmatory tests and that expected intervention would be reviewed by um, relevant um, uh, pediatric specialists and with overall approval through that clinical assurance group that we have with the NHS. Um, it's not meant to be prescriptive and it's location agnostic, but really there to help provide some consistency in terms of next steps, while that specialist team will need to make sure that they're considering individual factors like whether the baby is symptomatic at that stage or whether there is a known family history that might tailor the next steps that they undertake with that family. We also know that it's really important to have um, access to information for families at the point when they first hear about that result, because regardless of the amount of preparation that we can do around consent, uh, there's a lot going on in the newborn period and um, our understanding of experiences of um, current sort of newborn screening results is that these are really difficult times for parents, even if there are clear next steps afterwards, um, it's really difficult to hear about the potential for their child to have a potentially life changing condition so it's about doing as much much as we can to ameliorate that time as, as possible. So alongside a confirmatory test pathway that's more um, clinical team facing, we've developed a high level accessible bit of information um, for each of the conditions we're looking for, um, partly to help support that informed Googling that we know will naturally happen when you first hear that your child might have a condition you've probably never heard of before. And these information sheets also allow us to link in with relevant patient organizations. Um, to help also with that initial um, phone call, um, which can be very difficult for the parents, but also the healthcare professionals who may be more used to giving bad news, but in a context where there's already symptoms being present. Um, we've also um, designed this results call guideline, which can act as a bit of a chart note as well to help take those specialist clinical teams through that first call, making sure they're really clear and directive about what was found, that it's a screening result at this point, and that further next steps will need to be taken. Again, meant to be supportive rather than prescriptive, um, as we know that different pediatric specialist teams will have a, a range of experience in doing this already. So a couple of things just to wrap up, we have um really uh, put a big focus um, also on staff training and engagement, um, because if we want this to work re well, we really want to build a lot of that capacity and knowledge of how genomics impacts sort of newborns and healthcare in general and screening into the NHS. And there's a lot of great work already happening in the Genomic Medicine Service Alliances and various other initiatives that are helping to upskill healthcare professionals to think about genomics as part of their daily practice. So <clears throat> we've worked with the uh, National Genomics Education Team to help us develop a competence framework and resources based on those competencies. Uh, and that really helps the training to be modular. It's um, not specific to individual roles, but more thinking about the knowledge that anyone might need to have if they're helping to support a participant through different stages of that study process. Um, we're also working with that same team um, to develop condition-specific G-notes, uh, G-notes being a really helpful just-in-time resource for clinicians that we think will help um, with the wider range of healthcare professionals that may not often come across some of the rare conditions that the study would be testing for.
Um, and finally, um, I'd be pointless running a study if we're not really carefully evaluating it as we go along. Um, as Genomics England, we're very much the evidence providers rather than the decision makers, uh, which would fall to the government, to the National Screening Committee, to NHS England to make on the basis of what our study finds. Um, so we have a range of research questions more uh, detailed outlined in our protocol that capture things like what the um, feasibility and acceptability is, what the impacts are, both um, positive and negative on participants and the NHS and wider stakeholders as well. We want to make sure that we're able to follow up with families in the short and long term, whether that's their experiences of consent or in getting a result, and also thinking about how what it looks like to run something like this in the NHS and the perspectives of those healthcare teams involved, um, as well as the long term kind of cost effectiveness and health economic aspects of this study as well. So in summary, um, just to give an idea of a timeline as I started at the beginning, since we shared our initial list of conditions um, mid last year, we're just at the stage of starting to enroll the first participants into the study and that we expect to rapidly increase in the coming months with our current funding uh, currently confirmed until April 2025. Thank you for listening. I know that was a whistle stop tour, but hopefully we've got a few minutes at the end for any questions. And I've put uh, my email and our general generation study team email on there as well, if you have further questions after today. Thank you very much indeed, Amanda. That really was a whistle stop tour through an extremely complicated study, which has been three years in, in the making. We have a wonderfully um, diverse and interesting set of questions. So I suggest we try and tackle a couple of those um, quickly now. Um, and uh, there is a lot more information about the study on the Generation Study website. So um, for some of the sort of fact based questions, please do go and look there if we don't get to your to your question. So um, the first uh, question that um, I wanted to put to you is, um, to, two related questions. Sorry, the questions have got very, um, very full. So the first one is a, co a combination of two different questions. If these participants can be tracked into adulthood, this could be the most comprehensive whole genome and whole life data set ever. Is this going to be possible? And related to that, um, about the, um, the plan to uh, periodically reanalyze the data. Yes, um, so um, I think that's a, a good a good point that um, obviously our aim of the generation study is to be able to have a longitudinal data set that we can help us to evaluate the impact of that initial analysis over time and having that in the National Genomic Research Library with that link to longitudinal health data does mean that we have that ability to um, conduct further research um, in the long term. Um, I'd say roughly up till more 16 at the moment as opposed until adulthood. That stop gap is really because we not need to make sure that we are then going back to those participants to ask themselves to make a decision as to whether they would want to continue to be part of that research um, library at that point. Um, in terms of reanalysis, we don't have any definitive plans to reanalyze at very specific points at the moment, um, but our consent model allows us to go back to families, um, recontact them to either invite them for further research or evaluation or other questions about the study. So we have that ability to go back to participants in the future if we felt that a further reanalysis might might be helpful at a future stage um, to see if that's something that participants would be happy to undertake. Brilliant, thank you. Um, the next question is, you mentioned that you're targeting from lists of known conditions and associated genes and variants. Is whole genome really necessary here over exome sequencing? How much are we using the non-coding regions? And is the diagnostic yield increase worth, worth the substantial cost increase? Great question. I would say the second question is something that we would hope to answer through running the study. That's key from our evaluation that we look at the potential cost benefits, both monetary and impact wise on families as to whether that earlier diagnosis um, made a difference as, as opposed to how those conditions are diagnosed in the genomic medicine service at the moment. Um, Sorry, can you repeat the first bit of that question again? It was uh, so just about whether to what extent we're using the whole genome and what the benefits are. Oh, of the yes. Genome over exome. Yeah, so um, and uh, I'm sure one of our genome data scientists would be able to answer this much more eloquently than I could. But um, uh, I think we, we've, we certainly feel and, and knowledge we've gained from the 100,000 Genomes Project and the GMS. Um, and now the what used to be the rapid exome service in uh, that's run out of Exeter is now a rapid genome service, I think would suggest that we're able to, to find a wider range of pathogenic and likely pathogenic and other variants through a genome um, better than we can to an exome. Um, 
And our hope is that even if there aren't a large number of non-coding variants that we're directly testing for at the moment, that's where that ongoing research element comes in, where we've got the potential with that data to be able to adjust our pipeline in the future and be able to look for other variants in the future as we learn more about those. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Amanda. There has be, there's, there have been lots more questions in the chat, and I really apologise that we haven't had a chance to answer all of those. It's great to see so much interest in the study, and I think, um, again, as with our, our first talk this afternoon, we we, we might in, um, consider in, inviting Amanda back to tell us more about the study um, in, 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 um, in the future. Um, but please do have a look at the study website, um, and um, thank you very much for all your engagement and, and participation in the, um, in the seminar today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next month for next month's seminar and then um, we hope to very very much to see you at um, GERS. So a huge thank you to all three of our speakers this afternoon and to all of you for your participation in today's research seminar. Mm -hmm.